I mind if I decide to have you exist in my mind? And if I decide that you don't exist, you just went poof. <laughs> see? It's called existentialism, see? Now, watch what happens here. I've sat here with these guys, and they come out of, of these loony bins. You don't know whether they're on drugs or just been out of philosophy course. It wouldn't make any difference. Their eyeballs are still blunked out, you know? And they walk up to you, and you start, they got some one of these great ideas, they're going to pull on you, and you sit there and start, well, now, this and this and this and this and this, and pretty soon they see that you're getting them in a hole. And they say, man, you don't exist. They just wiped you out. You just go, Phew. now they're mine. They don't have to deal with you. They don't have to deal with reality. They just want pop. You see? Once I've got a guy believing that, he's nothing but putty in my hands. He's nothing but a tool. Now, I want to tell you something. You might want to accept the possibility, number four, but I refuse. All right? I refuse because if I accepted that as a possibility, I only put it up there because I had a show that I had a complete system. Remember I said I have to have them all? Either it's always been here, it got here by natural way, it got here by non-natural way, or never got here at all. That's the only possibilities, isn't it? And unless I got all the possibilities in there, I cannot come to a conclusion, right? But I am going to come to a conclusion, number one, this is not true. If I would buy the possibility of that, I have declared myself insane, both medically and physically, or, or legally. And anybody who buys that is insane. You want to know why we're sending out these uh, insane people off of our school campuses? It isn't just the pot. It isn't the drugs. They're drugs. They already got mental drugs before they ever got dropped the real acid. Their brain was already blown. They couldn't deal with the world around them, so they just dropped acid to relieve the, to relieve the pain. What they were taught obviously didn't fit the facts. All right, now let's leave the three that have some semblance of, of sense. Not too much for two of them. Now, what is the first law of science? Also called the first law of thermodynamics. And if the laws of thermodynamics are not true, then all science ceases to exist. The possibility of science ceases to exist. So there are no scientists if these laws don't hold. What's the first law? The conservation of matter. That nothing is being created or destroyed. That the quantity of the universe is constant. All right? If the quantity of the universe is constant in all of our observation, and the scientist is dealing with what he can observe, right? He never saw anything come into existence out of nothing, and he never saw anything that was in existence become nothing. Change form, yes. But you always end up with the same amount in another form. Therefore, the stuff could not come by natural generation because we do not observe it anywhere. And if we did observe it, then we got a big problem scientifically. If I put A in a test tube and B in a test tube and C happens to be coming into existence out of nothing in my test tube, I can't come up with any conclusion about A and B because that's all I knew I put in the test tube. When I put A and B in the test tube as a scientist, I believe that whatever reaction I get is because of A and B that I put in the test tube, right? What happens if C's are just coming out of nothing and just happen to be popping into my test tube? You see, scientists, science ceases if we're dealing with an accidental system. Science is based on the fact that we're not dealing with an accidental system, but we're dealing with a known quantity. All right, do you see this? So if any man says he's a scientist and believes in evolution, he cannot be. Because he just now overrode the first law of thermodynamics. What's the second law of thermodynamics? Energy entropy, right? That energy is kind of in a constant state of being coming more disorganized. That is, it's becoming diffused. We burn a lump of coal, the energy has gone out, the energy is still there, but it's not concentrated. It's always in a less concentrated form. When we drive our cars and burn our gasoline, we're moving from a more concentrated energy to a less concentrated energy. As uranium continues to give off its energy, the energy is still there, but it's going from more concentrated to less concentrated. The sun is radiating out energy in massive doses. The energy is still out there in the universe, but it's always in a more dissipated form. And it continues to dissipate, continues to dissipate always never reversing, never being collected, always being dissipated. Watch. If all energy is constantly being dissipated, and if our matter has been here forever, 
It has all dissipated by now. now. Let me put this another way. Any process, no matter how slow in forever, is finished happening by now. Is there anybody that doesn't grab that? That's a very important thing. Any process, no matter how slow in forever, is finished. And eternity, eternal matter, always being here, means that all energy and all forces have ceased to exist. Do we find this world 458 degrees below zero with no molecular motion? Do we find no life, no heat, no light in the universe? That's the condition we have to have if the matter is eternal. According to all scientific law. And remember, this guy is claiming to be a scientist, right? So I'm going to hang him on his own rules. Well, we just blown that one. Well, <clears throat> by deduction, there is only one possible conclusion. And I'm not doing this by just giving you a belief. I'm giving you the scientific laws and rules leave us with only one conclusion, number three. One, that the universe is not infinitely old. Two, that there was a process of generation out of nothing into something that energy was being collected. Three, that that process stopped. And four, another process stopped some time ago, but not infinitely ago, of decay. But the universe has not always known decay. There was a period of time it had no generation. But it doesn't know it now. Well, we don't see generation taking place anywhere in the universe now, but obviously because it is generated up, it had to be generated. You see the point? Now, there's only one book I know agrees with that scientific analysis. The book of Genesis. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. That's why they don't like them. Genesis is 100% scientifically accurate. Or let's put this, it's the, uh, the only logical explanation that fits the facts, the scientific facts. All right? The others don't. Their basic problem is they deny God. They deny a personal God. They want to force. Let the force be with you. you see, an ignoramus going out in the field can tell there's some, something more than him around. Anybody looks at a buttercup or looks in a child's eye? Oh, uh, the, uh, the heavens declare his handiwork. You see? But they don't want to come into grips with a personal God that holds him personally responsible. We want an irresponsible each doing our thing. And we're ending up with a world with a basic political unit being totally destroyed in this country by a malicious machine which is called a family. The hammering on the women to go into the workplace, to abandon the family. The hammering on the men by sitting there making women take his jobs and so forth, so he is not the breadwinner and it takes two breadwinners in order to survive with the inflation, the massive interest in which we have to pay, with the tremendous interest on the federal debt, which has all been created by creating paper money out of nothing and then charging us interest on it to where we are having a continual fall in the real income of the worker. He gets more dollars, but the inflation rate's going up faster than his wages, and he's asked to hold his wage line in the face of 13, 15, and 18, and 20 percent inflation rates. So that his family has to go out and work, and the family unit ceases to exist. The constant pressure on the television, showing one, these women today who are at home, what do they watch on television? Soap operas, what are they? Course after course after course on adultery. One form of adultery after another, after another, after another, after another, hour upon hour upon hour upon hour of adultery. Who's sleeping with who now? And they follow everybody and know and go back for years of who slept when with whom. All named Derek. <laughs> Cutesy pies. Sitting there talking in the living rooms, small sets, doesn't take much, and going through all of this drivel, 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 drivel. How long do you think our society can survive that? My wife and I were at the, uh, the biggest hotel in the world the other day. And here's in a bookstore. My wife is not one who gets in the magazine saying we were looking at something. And she looked up and she saw these, the girly magazines. 
She said, they don't put clothes on the covers anymore. I says, honey, whatever it is today, it'll be worse next month. You can guarantee it. It isn't just a passing fad. It is a course and a direction. How long do you think your children are going to survive this? Each doing his own thing. Who's going to say what's right and wrong? Well, I want to tell you, someone did say what was right and wrong, and he's not going to change it. He didn't ask you. And I want to tell you, when a society doesn't know what's right and wrong and won't punish what's right and wrong, this society's in trouble. And there's going to be blood in the streets. I mentioned, somebody mentioned to me this little thing. I used to run this hotel down in Detroit, which was all uh, mostly ex-convicts out of Jackson State Prison. We have the largest prison in the world, in Michigan, one of our great distinctions. Jackson State. These guys all talk like they're uh, <clears throat> all graduates of uh, <laughs> their alma mater, you know? You'd think they were talking about their prep school. They're talking about uh, their time in Jackson State. Anyway, almost all of them are narcs, and they can get more narcs in Jackson State than anywhere else. If you really want to get high, you go to get in prison there. Now tell me how a prisoner gets all the narcotics he wants. Wouldn't you think that they were illegal? The one place he couldn't get them was in prison? The government is feeding them. You ever figure that out? I want to tell you, they can tell with these satellites a rifle in the woods at 400 miles. Do you mean to tell me you can't pick up a boat carrying up hash coming up out of, out of Columbia? They could have everyone stop every day, and not one ounce would get through if they wanted to. And these guys are down the basement. And these are pretty hardened criminals. And I'm down there alone, you know, and they're sitting there. And uh, uh, these people all happen to be black. And I don't want to particular on that because we can talk about the white. This just happened to be that they were black. And they're talking about the big payoff, and we're going to get back, and all this sort of stuff. There's no payoff. What are you talking about payoff? There's about 15 or 20 guys never shouting in there. Like, what are you talking about payoff? We're going to get whitey. We're going to take care of you guys. I said, no, you're not, because I want to tell you what happened. Those boys have got you on a needle. And the day they pull that needle, you'll lick boots. You'll lick anybody's boots who got that, and they know it. They got you right where they want. All they got to do is pull that needle, and these guys about turned white. Their eyes opened up. They knew it. They knew they were on that hook. And whoever controls that hook has got them enslaved. Uncle Tom never had anything like that going for him. Or Simon Legree. He never, he only had a whip. He didn't have a needle in their arm. They've built an army of these guys. They feed them now, and you shut it off when you want them out in those streets, and they'll do what they're told. It is an accidental. When you see them standing in the middle of the main street in Detroit, out there pedaling, lined up there, pistoling to the cars just like this, right now, <laughs> at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Traffic jams. People buying heroin, buying their Coke. They're being fed. Here's the state of Michigan. For years, they put all these guys in jail for running numbers. So they got a state lottery. So the state runs numbers, and the banks collect the money, and the people go into the banks and turn in their lottery money, and all the nice, high, fluting banks, all in, their, in the lottery business, and every drugstore, and everybody's selling lottery. Yeah, and now we got the state. Of course, it's moral when the state does it. It's immoral if you do it. You go to jail, still in Michigan, for selling numbers. Unless you're a druggist and you got their monopoly sign out front. Then they put a computer in so you can sell them faster. They sit there and you go in there and these people don't buy an A ticket for a dollar. They go in for fifty dollars. And those tickets come off the in rows, and these people are taking bundles of these things out. Hey? Gambling's illegal unless we get our cut. Now, all of it comes from a basic view of who you are and what you are and where you came from and who you're responsible to. And you got that all befuddled up. You're going to be a ship without a rudder. I'll guarantee it. Well, anyway, let's take a break for tonight and we'll convene. I don't know how long I've been going here. What time are you set? Huh. Quite after seven. Oh, okay. We have a little warm up. Now tomorrow we're going to go and take a look at some history. We'll take a trip down the Nile. We'll go into some of the temples at uh, <clears throat> at uh, 
Khufu and Edfu and uh, let's see where else we'll get to. We'll get to Luxor, right? And what's there on the other side of Luxor? Is that the big one? Uh, hmm. Karnak. No, you go up river, uh, down river to Giza. We'll go to Giza and go into the, the big one. And then we'll show you what that's about. And the political control system. And it's all part of the political control system. You see it on the back of your dollar bill, don't you? And they put their emblem there for you, so you know where it came from. Anyway, we'll take that little look, and then we're going to go to Russia for a little trip. Uh, I'm going over there a while back. I don't want to show you any, any travel log. I'm going to show you uh, a hope, uh, and we'll show you some slides that uh, how we're being used on that one. And then in the evening, we will end up with a, another little session. So until then, uh, bid you all adieu, and if you want to hang around here in the heat and feel welcome, and I'll be here for a while. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. And 300 concubines, boy, that must have been the most miserable man that ever walked. Anyway, and all of the palaces, all the wealth, and all of the power was all worthless. You know, he said, and, and you know, as you get older, you start thinking of this. If you ever start accumulating any wealth, there's a little problem that comes. Here you are, you're working, you're getting kind of successful, and you've got to realize something. You're going to check out. And uh, if you leave it to your children, you're going to ruin them. <laughs> and, if you, and you think the rest of the people don't deserve it anyway. And what do you do with it? Man keeps going on through his uh, life as if this thing is going to go on forever, you know, and all these plans. And one day it comes to the realization, hey, it isn't going to be that way. It's not going to be. And you wonder, what's it all about? What's the purpose of it all? Uh, the... Uh, I, I, something came into my mind, I got to get rid of it. The other day I was watching a Muppet show, and they were having the pigs in space. How many have seen the pigs in space? Anyway, <laughs> they were sitting there, and here out there, uh, it came on the screen, this little blip was coming towards them on the screen. And then the, a voice came to him and it says, that in one minute from now is coming the end of the entire universe. And uh, of course, there's one guy, Muppet keeps walking around with the end of the world is coming. He says, that's far more important than the end of the universe. But anyway, you got the end of the universe coming one minute from now. And just then there was a, a buzz takes place. And the Captain Pig, whatever his name is, Mr. Hogback or whatever it is, he gets up and he starts running out. And Miss Piggy says, where are you going, Captain? He says, it, well, that, that's the dinner bell. You know, it's time, time to eat, see. And it is, uh, they're in this rocket ship in space. And he says, uh, and he says you mean you're going to go eat? One, in one minute, there's going to be the end of the universe. He says, yes, but the night is um, a swine stroganoff, <laughs> a swill stroganoff, <laughs> and a swill stroganoff. And away he rushes out, and the other two sitting there, Miss Piggy and this other uh, pig, they're sitting there, and they say, just think that. <laughs> they're sitting there watching the end of the world, going to come, and they're going to know the meaning of life. The meaning of life is going to be given them at the end of the universe. And they're all waiting for the meaning of life. And finally, Miss Piggy turns to the other one and says, Swill stroke enough. And they both rush out to get their swill stroke enough. Well, you see, the whole meaning and purpose of life, to most people, they just run back out and get some more swill stroke enough. Anyway, there's a lot of philosophy in that little, little show. <clears throat> well, the. Uh, the pattern of what I'm trying to say of what has been is the pattern of what is now and until the Lord comes is the pattern that's going to be. 
uh, pattern doesn't change much. And if one who does not, as uh, Santayana said, he who does not learn from history is con condemned to repeat it. And we're going to probably repeat it anyway, but it's nice to have learned from it. So let's talk a little bit about history. And to do that, let's step back a little bit and talk about economics or political power, which, of course, seems to have a big point in history. History, in most of your textbooks, will be talking about the history is the story of man. No, history is not that. What history is, his story. It's the story of God's working in this world. History is God's story, not your story. Notice the complete change that you will have. History is his story. Anyway, for those who are deists, uh, Ben Franklin was a deist and so forth, uh, and uh, basically masonry is a deistic religion. Deism says this, yes, yeah, there was some force or God while it created this thing, and then he went to sleep, or he turned it over us to run it. And this God does not take any direct uh, action in the affairs of his creation. He merely wound it up and left it go. Now, this is also the attitude of most people who named the name of Christ. When you go down and, and search down where they really believe, they had the deistic uh, uh, theology. And that theistic theology leaves them running wild. Well, let's get back to our history. <clears throat> uh, if we were going to take the history of events of the last hour in this world, or in the United States, or in Pennsylvania, or in this town, or in this block, nobody could write it because most of the events that take place simply are not known by a person who would write it. And the second thing is, any because of the rare data of a fact in the events that take place constantly all over the universe as well as this world are so multitudinous. And second, the cause of them unknown. You see there are people write a book, say, on the First World War causes of the First World War. What were the causes of the First World War? Well, these are the causes believed by the guy who wrote the book. But what did he know? What did he sit in at the consoles? Does he know what was really the motives in the hearts of the different people who played? And does he really know all the economic and political involvements? Does he know of all of the, the machinations of all of these people? No, he doesn't. He had a theory. He believed a certain reason was a cause of the war. Then he goes around and finds those evidences that support his theory because he takes all the data that he can get and he decides what's important data and what's unimportant. How did he decide what is important and what is unimportant? He had his theory first. His theory of why he thinks the war started causes him to select those things that agree with his theory and to reject those things that don't agree as being unimportant, obviously. Right? So what does he do is he ends up proving what he believed to be in the first place by selecting the evidence that seems to support it. That is, he proved nothing. And what he has said is absolutely uh, irrelevant. What he has given you is opinion based on no fact at all, just his speculation. It has to be. And if I wrote a history, it would be the same way. <laughs> all right? Now, because we all approach history from our point of view, from our set beliefs. Now, the beliefs that you have are religious. So that every history is going to present a religious point of view, not because the person may overtly intend to, because he can't do otherwise. It's the very nature of things. Do we see this? All right, now, when I approach history, I appoint, approach it from my point of view. And I have my bias, as every other historian has his bias. And I select to present to you those things that I want to present to you because they support a theory that I have in the first place. The only difference between myself and them is I'm going to tell you my theory before. 
<laughs> you see? They don't, they probably don't even know they're doing it. They think they're being objective historians. But there's no way to be an objective historian. Whatever history you're going to write is going to reflect your bias and your view before you get there. Now, my point of view is this. I believe that the King James Bible in the English language is God's infallible word, inerrant, preserved by God as well as, uh, as uh, uh, written by the Holy Spirit, but that God directly preserved his word and delivered it as he promised to do. I believe that. Now, you may disagree with that, but I'm just telling you that because then you will know where I'm coming from. Why I have my view is based on my prejudice. And my prejudice is based upon the fact that I do believe that the King James Bible is the Word of God and that it contains all truth that God has chosen to reveal to us. Now, does it say it contains all truth? No, it doesn't. It contains that portion of truth that God has chosen to reveal to us. This means there are those things that he hasn't chosen to reveal to us. And on those things, as far as what God has said, I just simply don't know. And when you get to the point, I can't answer that. Maybe someday, but not now. Right? Now, let's take a look at the history of the world from a secular point of view. From a secular point of view. The world has known six world empires. And these empires, starting with Egyptian, Syrian, Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek, and Roman. These six world empires didn't happen at six different times, a phenomenon. They just here all of a sudden there was a world empire, and then the empire crumbled, and then along came a period of time, and then another empire came up. That isn't the way it happened. The Greek, uh, Egyptian world empire was overthrown by the Assyrian world empire. The Assyrian empire was overthrown by the Babylonian empire. The Babylonian empire was overthrown by the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians were overthrown by the Greeks, and the Greeks were overthrown by the Romans. There was only one world empire with six locations. From the whole history, from right after the flood to the time of the advent of Christ, there had always been a world empire. That was the normal system. There wasn't any time without it. There wasn't any elapse in this thing, you see, is what I'm trying to say. Now, the thing is that each of these empires were identical to the preceding one. They adopted the same religion, the same priesthood, the same temples, the same rituals. <laughs> they were, the only difference is we replaced the guys running it with our new, new gang. It's just like over in Russia. You had a Russian revolution supposedly back there in 1917, but it was nothing different. <clears throat> the Cheka got replaced by the NKGB. All right, the Tsar got replaced by Stalin. But in both cases, the people couldn't own property. In both cases, the people had no political rights. In both places, it was a total socialistic system dictated from the top. There was voting uh, for the Duma before, which meant nothing. And now there was a voting for the Supreme Soviet that meant nothing afterwards. The thing is, if you go over to Russia, is you'll notice something. There is no difference between Russia before the Tsars and after the Tsars. Why? We just replaced the Tsar with a new title for the new Tsar but the system remained totally intact. There was no alteration in the system at all. The alteration of, di uh, of distribution, the, the economic system, the political system remained intact. A, f a, a phony parliament with no power, <laughs> you know, in both cases. A military uh, 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 nation which had certain objectives and which have never changed. Russia today is no different than Russia in the ninth century. Their policies have not changed. And their policies have always been the same and remain the same. But, of course, you're supposed to think there was a revolution, a big change take place. When those Babylonians took on the Assyrian garments and entered those Assyrian temples, they took the Syrian religion in toto with no variation. Why? Not because you say, well, boy, this guy's just getting off on a whole bunch of religion. No, I'm getting off into politics and economics. Back in... Uh, uh, quite a few years ago, I read reading, must have been, hmm, well, time flies, uh, 20 years ago, I was reading a book by a man named Ludwig von Mises called Human Action. Now, Ludwig von Mises is probably, uh, certainly, the greatest mind in the field of economics that it has been, classical economist. 
And in there, he's made a statement. He said, all governments are popular. Well, at first blush, you look at that. Government's popular? Well, you've never seen anything in the whole world. The thing most people spend their time is discussing how what they don't like about government. And to think of them as popular. Well, the modern definition of the word popular, or usage of the word, not definition, they don't define it. Usage of popular means people like it. But that is not what the word means. What the word means is that you accept it. Not whether you like it. Popular means that the population accepts it. Now, was, was the Nazi government popular in Germany? Yep, the people accepted it. Is the communist regime in China popular? Yep, the people accept it. Now, if it's not popular, that means they're overthrowing it. Now, if there is an open revolt, those, only those people who are in open revolt against the regime can be said it's not popular with them. It doesn't say anything to whether they like it or not. Now, notice something. What is the purpose of political power? The purpose of power is to get other people to do what I want them to do. Generally, for them to perform things to the benefit of the ruling class, those people who are in power. You have two classes of people, though the ruled and the rulees, and the rulers and the rulees. Now, in order for this system to work, you've got to have a lot of rulees and very few rulers. Otherwise, there isn't a lot of advantage in the ruling business. That is that you have a small clique or group, always in every society, who are running things for their benefit, and they are running not things, they're running people. And different systems have been created to do it. In our country, what we have is no different than what is in the Soviet Union, only we do it by a different method. Instead of going and taking everything for the state and then doling out what we're going to give to the rulees, as done in Russia, what we do is make you think that it is all yours and then tax away 52% of it in taxes, taking away another 15% in interest payments on paper money created out of nothing which you have to pay to be able to use, something irredeemable pieces of paper, and then we have a tax of inflation on another 8 or 10%. So what it ends up, the, uh, the American citizen today does not able to acquire and enjoy 30% of his labor. 70 plus percent is taken from him while supposedly he's a free man. He's buying his own home. Are you buying your home or are you renting? The fact is, you're not buying any home. You're renting it from the bank. You're never going to pay that mortgage off. The interest is 80% of your payment or 90% of the payment. You're almost no principal on the thing. You're renting this house, but they make you think you're an owner. You keep it up better that way, you see? If you think, I'm a homeowner. No, the only thing you got is a big fat mortgage. I, uh, a few years ago, I've always bought my cars for cash, and I was a little short of money, and my wife's car was getting six, seven years old and kind of pretty bad. And I, well, the grumbles were getting terrible. So I went down, and I never did this before. I went into a car dealership, and they had a nice Olds 98 there with all the stuff on it. And I said to the man, what, do, uh, what would it take to have that car? And he says, well, $500. I said, you mean I give you $500 and I drive out with that nice car? And he says, yes. And I said, well, that's nice. I gave him $500 and I'm driving out in this nice car with loaded, you know, <laughs> top of the thing, loaded. And I'm driving down the street and I says, I always thought all these people own cars. These people are all renting on this rental business. Here, $500 and I'm now a car owner. No, I haven't. They sent me a big fat book. A big fat book full of little pages. And I'm going to be paying rent and interest on that car for years. By the time that last page is out of that book, you've got to trade that car in. It was designed to wear out in the number of pages of that book. You go get another one, they give you another fat book. And you continue renting this car. See? Now this system was very cleverly designed. It was designed to make you slaves while thinking you were free. See, the Romans never got to this, really. You know, the, the Russians have never figured that one out. It was the ultimate con. 
Yeah, I mean, there's one thing, you've got people who are slaves, they know they're slaves, you treat them like slaves, and they're always kind of grumbly, you know? You don't get much out of them. What they came up was with the most brilliant system, and they had to take you all to school in order to teach you the beautiful things of this system, that you're free with constitutional rights and everything else while they take away the fruits of your labor. How you think of yourself as being free, man? It was really, you've got to say, clever. Extremely clever. But I want to tell you, you try to get out of their system and see how nasty they get. They get real nasty if you quit turning over the fruits of your labor to them. And you'll find out one thing, that there is no difference between the IRS and the NKJB. They both operate with the same tactics, the same means, and totally without sight of the law. Look, at the secret pleas in Russia don't bother you as long as you do everything that you're told and you become a nice, obedient little lackey and you lick boots properly. And the IRS doesn't bother you as long as you do and stay in line and don't say the wrong things and do the wrong things. But you do, you're gonna have knocks on your door, either place. I have experience with that. I know from where I speak. Maybe some others here have had experiences. Well, anyway, let's get back here with this government being popular. What, what, uh, uh, what uh, Prime Mises is saying is this, that you see, in order to change a form of government, a political or social system, requires effort on the part of the people who would change it. It requires time, effort, money, if you're running even for political office, let alone take the more violent means of changing and altering government. You have to pay a price. Now, there's a price to live under any form of government, the taxes and et cetera. This is a price, it costs you, doesn't it? Now, there's a, what Bob Mises is taking this strictly economics. He says there's a cost to submit and there's a cost to revolt. Now, the reason why there isn't a revolution going on in the country today is simply that the American citizen has figured that the cost of revolting is higher than the cost of submission. The reason there's not a revolution taking place in Russia today is that the people in Russia figure that the cost of revolt is higher than the cost of submission. If at any time a people in any country come to the conclusion generally that the cost of revolt is cheaper than the cost of submission, you'll have a revolt. This is on Mises' position, you see. Now, I'm going to go beyond what he said. What is the ultimate cost of revolt? You see, if I'm going to raise my political power as a dictator, I must be sure that I raise the cost of resistance of me high enough that you won't do it. The reason I'm raising my political power, I want to increase my political power, is I want to take more away from you than I did before. So I'm going to be raising the cost of submission constantly. But I gotta be careful not to get the cost of submission above the cost of revolt. If I do that, you guys are gonna do me in. All right? Because remember, it's always a small clique in the ruler class, and the majority have gotta be rulees. So I'm dealing with a, against a superior number. But I gotta be sure that I keep them in check by making the cost of resistance to me too high. Well, then the next question comes, what is the ultimate cost? If I'm going to ultimate power, I must have the ultimate cost. What is the ultimate cost? What is the ultimate price that I can make you pay? What would it be? Pardon? Loss of the soul. Not life. Life is cheap because we're all going to die anyway. There have been millions of people who laid their life down for one silly cause after another over history. The man, in fact, that bad gave his right to a cause. Here's a guy yesterday telling him, well, Bonhoeffer proved that he was right. I said, how did Bonhoeffer prove that he's right? Well, he died for his beliefs. <laughs> so I mean, how many fools have died for their beliefs? There's many of people who have stood on the thin red line. There's many people who have mounted the barricades in one so-called great cause after another have gone down. Bobby Sands sat over there for absolutely worthless nothing, 
die to that prison, right? He may have thought it was important, but it wasn't. It's, a, it's just a silly thing, you see? But he's dead, okay? And he's a martyr because he died. That's all it that requires. To be died for a cause makes you a martyr, regardless of what cause it is, and every cause has got some. So that isn't the requirement here. The laying down the physical life is not important, or imprisoning and torturing, because all of these things, what can they do? There's just a limit they can do to my body, and it's going to die, and then <laughs> it doesn't make any difference anyway. Now, what are you going to do to a corpse? The Romans used to go out and punish them. Punish those corpses, but the corpse didn't bother them at all. See, you know, it didn't bother the corpse at all. When Cromwell, you see, they dug get Cromwell up after the restoration of the king, and they hung Cromwell, chopped his head off, put his head on a pike over the House of Commons. For a hundred years, Cromwell's head stood there on a pike <laughs> over the House of Commons. They were real sweet people over in England. <laughs> and Oliver Cromwell said, but you know what? They cut Oliver Cromwell's head off after he was dead, good and buried. But Cromwell cut off the king's head while he was alive. There's a lot of difference. <laughs> <laughs> the king cut off Cromwell's head after he was dead, but it didn't mean much. All right? We'll get to that in a little bit. So anyway, in order to raise this power, I must raise the cost. And the ultimate cost is this. If I could get you to believe that there's life after death, and that there's a heaven and a hell, under whatever name Valhalla we want to have, or so forth, happy hunting grounds, or so forth, and that the one place is a place of eternal bliss, and the other is a place of eternal forever and ever torment. If you believe that, and by the way, I do, but if you believed it, and you believe that Stuart Crane was the guy who could determine which one you got to, there's nothing I couldn't do to you for 70 years and you would submit to for an eternity. The ultimate political power is religion. That's why you see every kind of building on every kind of religion there is. There's something about religion. You wonder here, all these people who scoff, I'm an atheist. No. You walk down the street and drive down to any town or any place in this country, and you'll see buildings of all sorts, the religions. Whether we're talking about Masonic temples or synagogues or churches, they're religions. And all of these different groups from every kind of doctrine you can think of, Everything that imaginable you'll find. You know, you got a spectrum today in California. I always claim that a guy could put on a bed sheet and have 200 followers by nightfall. <laughs> Every nutty and cokey thing you can think of. There's nothing so weird that you can't get followers. Now, the point why this religion? Well, several things. One, the very universe tells every single one of us, whether we're God's child or not, that there is one. There is nobody outside of an absolute imbecile in this world who doesn't know there's a God. What about when Paul came to Athens? Now here's the center of all wisdom and knowledge, the apex, and here's Paul walking in there, nothing but the clothes his back. He shuffles up to Mars Hill, see? He comes up there, and these people who spent their whole life sitting around listening to great ideas and any new thing, all they wanted to do was just discuss the latest things. And remember, they didn't have television and all this great stuff, you know? They had to sit around and wait for something new to come down that road, looking out there across that road, waiting for something new. And here comes this new guy in, Paul. And Paul says to them, I perceive on my way to the forum that you're most suspicious. The superstitious, that you're most superstitious. I see down here you built an altar to the unknown God. Now they had a whole bunch of gods. They had all sorts of statues out there, but they, with all the statues, they knew that whatever created this was not that hunk of rock out there. They knew that. They knew that all their pictures and images and so forth, that's not it. They knew that because what they see could not have been created by that. That's obvious. You know, these people were not that dumb. And they had built all this stuff, you see, but all of that didn't mean anything. They had finally built this altar to an unknown God. 
What did Paul come there? Say, you bunch of pagans, I'm going to straighten you guys out? No, he says, I see that you built an altar to the unknown God. I'm going to tell, him, tell you about him. I came here to declare him unto you. You see? Man knows there's a God. And every sort of false imagination that can come into his mind, he'll dream up every single thing under the sun. And there are people who will take these things and open up a building and make a nice livelihood out of catering to this knowledge that people have that there is a God. They will give them every bit of poppycock there ever was. And they will grab them in and fill up plates and drive nice cars and live pretty good off it. Build great big buildings and edifices they can walk through as they get older. Have the great building that I have built and my congregation and my people and my building. Oh, I'll tell you, just as avarice as any greedy oil <laughs> magnet or banker ever was, right? But all in the piety. It's one of the biggest businesses in the world. And it's been going on longer than Standard Oil. It's always been going on. It's called the religious biz. Now, see, in the old days, you know, before modern times, no monarchies and so forth, there were only two ways to get ahead in the world. But for a common man, there was only one, the priesthood. He wanted to get an education. He wanted to get ahead. He wanted to get rich. He wanted to be important. For the common man, there was only one way. Get in that priesthood and grovel and drag yourself and do all the things and long enough, hard enough, and maybe you could make it. They allowed a commoner to rise. Only so far, because the top levels were all bought. <laughs> all right? <laughs> the pot, top bishoprics were all purchased. And they couldn't quite do that. But they could get up there and be at least somebody. Get out of, the, get out of that field out there with that little hole hanging in those rocks, trying to get themselves a little grub. They could become somebody and walk around and not have to dirty their hands. And live somewhat like a gentleman. Right? That was the priest at the ministry. And by the way, that's where most of the people got the call today to go to the ministry. They didn't want to work. <laughs> Yeah, their call came when they decided they had to go get a job. They decided they just got called. <laughs> you say some called, you see the word uh, apostle means the sent ones. And the Lord's ministers are called ones. And they always say some are called and some are sent. And some just got up and went. <laughs> Most just got up and went, I should say. Religious business is very powerful. Even, even Falwell has got, you see, he's now in the religious game. And he has found, hey, there's money in the religious politi politic business too. And he has found out that, boy, when you start getting into this politic business and start swinging a little muscle, yeah, that does things. And that's nothing new. Nothing new under the sun at all. The Roman Catholic Church has had a lot of muscle in religions for a long time, hasn't it? Falwell is just starting late and smaller, but that's all right. He's trying his best to move into the club, and if he could get elected pope, I'm sure he would be very happy to accept. Or maybe he wants to start his own, like Henry VIII. <laughs> Say, okay, let's uh, <clears throat> now move on to the point. The point is, that a religion, let's take a look at Egypt, under the pharaohs. The Egyptians, unlike the Greeks, were a different basic, basic philosophy at this time. The Egyptian belief was this, that eternity was everything and the present is nothing. Where the Greek philosophy was that the present is everything and the future and the past mean nothing. This is why the Greeks were not interested in any real history, recording events. They didn't build any permanent buildings in the Doric, but built period, early periods, only wooden buildings. They weren't concerned about lasting things. But what about these Egyptians? They hauled rocks. And they built things, and you can go over and see them now, 3,000 years later, in excellent condition. The future was everything. The present was nothing. The man would live as an absolute poverty, in absolute poverty all his life to save every penny for his casket. 
a casket, which would be these caskets you go over and look at, uh, a cost of fifty or seventy thousand dollars in today's price, because that was eternity and that was everything. Well, with a people like that, you can get them to haul rocks. You know, if I can make you that eternity is everything, and I am the guy, the Pharaoh. Who was Pharaoh? Was he just a man? No, he was God man, Christos, Christ. He claimed to be God man, that he came down from the sun, that he was a direct a child of Osiris, and that he was God with them, Emmanuel. Now, if you believe that, that that guy up there in Memphis was God sitting there in Karnak Temple, and he said, do something, and you are going to go to hell forever or forever in heaven, and that was the, mo the only important thing in your life, you'll haul rocks. You'll do whatever he says. There is no limit to what he can get you to do. You see my point? Because there's an eternity out there. Now, if it was just a matter he could kill you, well, you might say, I'm going to take my chances, and I'm going to go get that guy. And maybe you get cut down. Many people have done that in the charge, haven't they? As the, as the, uh, the British had 50,000, <laughs> they lost in three hours on the 1st of July in 1916 on the Somme. A million Frenchmen went down at Verdun. Two and a half million at Tannenberg. You see? Oh, <laughs> people have gone out. Look at those men landing to the beaches of Tarara and Coagulane. No, the eternal, uh, the physical life is not important. And what, by the way, what do they teach you today? The sacredness of human life. Human life is not sacred. It's temporary, transitory. Nothing sacred about it. God slew and slaw. Saul slew and slaw. David slew and slaw. They slew and slaw and slew and slaw all the way through that Old Testament, didn't they? <laughs> they slew them up one side and slaw them down the other. Why? Human life is not important. God in one night wiped out the army of Snickerib before Jerusalem, didn't he? 135,000 Midianites went down with uh, Gideon in one night. 100,000 of Sennacherib's armies, the Syrians. You say, oh, that was terrible. No, they were all going to die anyway. The Lord blocked uh, Lazarus back from the grave, didn't he? Where's Lazarus now? He died. Those are realities. All right. So, the Pharaoh's power was not in the fact that he was king, but in the fact that he was God in the eyes of his people. Are you following this point? Notice, when the Pharaoh was overthrown, what did the king of Assyria declare himself to be? The God man. What did when the Babylonians overthrown the Assyrians? We have now a record of this one, right? Here we have Nebuchadnezzar sets up the the image, doesn't he? And had all the people with the sackbuts and the trumpets and so forth. They're going to fall down before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. What was he doing? He declared that this was God, that he was God. And they all had to bow down and worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. He adopted the religion of the Assyrians. The same temples, the same religion, and so forth. Well, it's interesting here. We have in the Bible only a few people that we have really real uh, portion of Scripture outside that somebody just mentioned and passes on, in which we don't have some sin recorded. Now, of course, we have the sin of David with Bathsheba, right? We have the sins of Solomon going before the witch of Endor and things of this sort. We have Moses. He was a murderer. But we have a person like Joseph, one of the few characters in the Bible with no sin recorded at all. 
There's 153, or I passed or went through 153 similarities of Joseph's life and that of Christ. A tremendous uh, thing. But we have another person, Daniel. Do we have a sin of Daniel recorded in the Bible? Hmm? Do we have a sin, for those of you who are Bible scholars? Yes. All the governors of all the provinces of Babylon were there before that image of Nebuchadnezzar. And they all fell down, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where was Daniel? He was laying right flat in his face in front of that image. It should have been Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, it shouldn't have been. There should have been four in that fiery furnace instead of three. Where was Daniel? He copped out. By the way, we have another one too, but we won't get into that now. But anyway, here we have the record. When the Medo-Persians overthrew the Babylonians, the exact same religion, the same system, the God-man. And the Greeks, again, what did Alexander the Great, when he came into Babylon, do? He put on the Babylonian garments, went into the temples, and it was declared God, very God, with us, Emmanuel. 333 B.C. and Babylon. What about Caesar? What does the word Caesar mean? God, man, Christ. He was God. The image of the bust of Caesar had to be worshipped. Why do you think those people were there before the lions? They refused to burn the incense before the bust of Caesar. All they had to do was burn the incense to Caesar, recognize him as a God. Not the God, but a God. You see, according to these religions, any god will do. Just, I mean, uh, the pagans, you see, they'll burn an incense to this god or that god or this god. It could be Diana or Cyrus or Thor or, Thor or, or Shingmu or Tamas. It makes no difference. It's all the same religion anyway, isn't it? See? The only people got in trouble are the ones that say they aren't all the same religion. No, we will not burn the incense before any of them. What were they doing? They were saying, your gods are phony. That's the political problem. Look, if these people would burn, if, if the Christians, and read the book, or letters uh, uh, plenty to, tell, uh, to uh, Trajan. And Trajan's letters back to Pliny. Pliny is saying, here are these Christians are leading a lot, good orderly life. Uh, they're moral in character. They meet together and sing some hymns and eat meals together in the morning. Uh, as far as citizens, we can find nothing wrong. But they will not burn the incense to thy bust, old Trajan. Do I need to kill them all? Could I not show mercy to small children or young girls? The law says I must kill them all, which of course is a just law. But could you allow me the mercy of sparing the children? And Trajan writes back, he wishes he could, but he simply cannot do it. We understand what this, this sect does. What was the, what they were doing? It wasn't what they were doing. It's what they were not doing. They were not recognizing Trajan as God. And if they didn't recognize Trajan as God, the power of Rome was overthrown. This man is only a man over there in Rome. How are you going to hold this empire together just being a man, putting on your pants one leg at a time like everybody else? The empire required a strong hand, and that strong hand could only be through religion. There's no other way to have it. Now, if they would burn the incense to Caesar and practice the Christian religion, fine. They're to be let go. They can worship however they want, but burn that incense to Caesar. When they were hauled before these lions, all they had to do, any one of those people there in the Circus Maximus, ready to be eaten by those lions, all they had to do was turn to Caesar and say, Hail, Lord, and they were let out. They could sit there and justly say, these men are committing suicide. Couldn't they? 
I mean, after all, we've given them every opportunity to recant. As, as plainly said, I have given them every opportunity to recant. We have begged with them. We have pleaded with them. We have done everything to try to save their lives. Plenty, uh, his heart was being torn by what he was doing. But these people are implacable. They will not change. Their resistance is resolute. That cannot be tolerated. Now notice, those people, just like those three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't do anything. It's what they weren't doing that got them in trouble. You see? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing there along with all these multitudes. They were standing there. They came as the king had ordered. And they stood there, and everybody fell down, and they didn't do anything. They stood there. They found themselves in a fiery furnace for doing nothing. Those people there before those lions, it wasn't what they did. It's what they wouldn't do. Because if that king is not God, he has no power. What does the word czar mean? Caesar, Slavic for Caesar, God-man. He was not just the king of Russia. He was the pope of the uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Church. He was both the spiritual leader, could send every Russian, a little Russian baby to hell or to heaven. It was in his power. What does the word Kaiser mean? It's Germanic for Caesar or Christ, the God-man. Henry VIII, what did he do? Was he a first Protestant king? No, he wasn't Protestant at all. King Henry VIII was Catholic to the day he died. But he was English Catholic. He decided he was not going to follow any pope in Rome. He decided the pope ought to be in London. And his name was Henry. And he elected himself pope. The same priesthood, the same temples, the same statues, the same liturgy, the same everything except the Pope had now moved to London. That's all Henry did. He did not change the religion. He just changed who the head of it was. He realized that his power rested on his independent religious power. You see, all the kings in Europe got their crowns from the Pope and on his divine right theory. Now why? For the Roman Catholics, in Europe, could they revolt against their monarch when that crown was placed in the monarch's head by the Pope who had the power to send them to hell forever for raising their hand against God's uh, divine king? The power that kept the crown on the French crown and on the German crown and all of these princes was not their military might, but was the Pope. And in return for that, the Pope expected from them certain favors like money and defense. All right. The Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman or empire. But it was a political expediency. The kings needed the, the religious support to maintain their position and their ability to extract the labor of their subjects. And that was true. But in England, because it was a nice canal separating them, Henry decided, this is such a good one, but I don't need to be in that club. I can set up my own independent club. He didn't change the game, he just changed, made himself stronger in the game. He was not a Protestant king. He was a English pope. <laughs> Make a clear distinction between the two. Now, the whole idea there of Babylon and back there in Egypt with the Pharaoh had not changed until 1540s or 1640s. Historically, a great event took place. The most important historical event in our history took place in 1611, really 1609 at the commission, but 1611 with the publishing of the King James Bible. Now before then, there were some other very important historical events. Most notably of all in history, in the second century, the invention of paper by Ling, uh, Ling Mao in China. The invention of paper, which was kept secret for a thousand years from the Western world, and while China had books, the Western world had to haul around these sheepskins, which couldn't get, contain much. Finally, when the Western world got paper, then came along a man named Gutenberg in 1453 with a printing press. 
And with paper and the printing press, books now became possible in the common hand. At 1611, the King James Bible was published. This Bible, uh, which is still considered the hallmark of the English language, it is the apex, the greatest work ever written, and the most perfect work ever written from a linguistic point of view. This book was not just the fact that it was published, like somebody said, well, it was something that was published in 1974. Well, that doesn't really mean much. But you have to realize it was published in a world or in a nation that had no other books. So everybody in England who was going, could read had in their library one book. So if they were going to read, they read that book. And if you couldn't read and wanted to be read to, remember there wasn't a lot of movies and theaters and nightclubs and there wasn't, you know, you sat home with this little thing here and you're going to do something. And you, maybe you want to be read to rather than sit there and watch the fly flying around. All right? Well, if you do that, you're going to be read to from that book. What happened after 1611 is something that never happened in the world before. I should say uh, that I know of. That is that the Bible became such common knowledge to a whole population of a nation, major nation. That is, the English population knew that Bible kiver to kiver. They quoted it in business, they used it in their love letters, in their normal correspondence. It was the language of the street. It totally permeated these people to actually they knew that book. Now, as they read that book, they found out something. Their king is in heaven. There are high priests in heaven. The price was paid on that altar, and there's no more price to be paid. That no man in this world can determine where you spend eternity. That that king is answerable to that God the same as they are. You know what that did to the political system of England? It was a, I don't think uh, James had that in mind. But the thing is, what you had was a complete reversal of all political, social, economic, as well as religious thought. Why? Because all thoughts, all positions are religious. Whether we're talking about science, our view of it, or history, or economics, whatever it is, you have to think, think of the basic nature of man, of eternity, of responsibility. These are all religious before you come up with what system is just and right and equitable and so forth. What happened in England was this. By 1630, these people realized that God had told them in secular matters they are to obey their king, that he is set in rule over them. They are answerable to the magistrates. But in spiritual matters, no. In spiritual matters, they were answerable only to God. Well, you know what happens to a people like that? The king realized very quickly he was no longer king. He had to be concerned what the people thought. The parliament started getting very jumpy. The parliament would not endorse his decrees. He decided that he was going to reverse the situation. And what did he do? He set out a king's decree. That religious freedom was guaranteed to all subjects of England, but that in all public worship, all prayers must be read from the book, common book of prayer of the High Anglican Church. Well, not necessarily the, church, the prayers in the, book of the high prayer book are that bad. I'm not passing judgment on the prayers. I haven't read them. But the thing is that the uh, Catholics thought that was super. The Anglicans thought it was even better than that. And the, uh, the Presbyterian clergy went along with it, though the people didn't like it. But you had in the south of England a whole bunch of these people called Puritans. Now, Puritans believed that the Bible alone was their total source of God's word and refused to accept anything else, regardless of what it was, on principle. And they were willing to die for that. And so we had a civil war, the English Civil War. And this civil war was not going so well. The king, of course, had all the trained military against the rabble. And the rabble were being slaughtered off pretty good. And the king uh, 
won every battle with greatly in, inferior numbers. Finally, the last battle of the, uh, of the, what appeared going to be the last battle was the Battle of Oxford, which the Parliament was making this last stand. And uh, at that battle, up rode a farmer, a Puritan, who was also a preacher. They rode up the Lord Essex, leading the parliamentary forces, who are, by the way, called roundheads. You know why they're called roundheads? They had short hair. The king's people all wore long hair. They were long hairs against the short hairs. Now, the long ones, of course, the cavaliers versus the roundheads. And the parliamentarians were called roundheads. They cut their head short, hair short because they hated the effeminate ringlets of the king. And so that's why they were identified, round hair, long hairs versus the short hairs. Anyway, <clears throat> this battle was going, uh, the parliamentarians had been losing again, and it looked like the whole civil war was over, when up rode a man with 114 horse. This man, is say, he's 43 years old, he was not a trained soldier, but he was trained in the Bible. And he went up to Lord Essex, he says, you cannot defeat men of noble birth with bartenders. That's what he called the rabble, the parliamentarians, the scum of the street, whatever you scrape together. Those men are men of spirit. I'll show you men of greater spirit. And his 114 horse attacked, and this is their first battle. And within a matter of a few hours, the 15,000 soldiers of uh, the king had to fall on his person to get him safely off the field from the assaults of this man, Oliver Cromwell. And for the first time in the history of the Civil War, the parliamentarians, though they we couldn't say won the battle, they stood the field at nighttime. After this, Oliver Cromwell fought 50 major battles. He's the only general in history that never retreated a foot in a single battle, and he never entered in a battle with over 20% of the number of troops of his enemy. He now went with his 114 horse and relieved the town, besieged by 10,000 men, and relieved them in an afternoon. Every battle was this way. He's a very interesting general. Every time he would send his report back to Parliament, he would start out with a long praise unto God because only God's hand could do this. God, again, this day, showed his miracle. For what other explanation could it be? He never commanded over 230 horse. And yet every army of the king was, de uh, was decisively defeated in a battle with odds so unbelievable that you would have to go to Gideon in the Midianites to find comparison. Now, the American Revolution was not won at Yorktown. It was won at Nasby Field. I was giving this talk one time in 1976. This is one of the first time I gave it to the American Legion in Greenville, South Carolina, which is a good Masonic group. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was explaining to them, because they asked me to come in and speak on the American Revolution. And I talked about Oliver Cromwell, and we ended in 1658. And I said, gentlemen, you now have the American Revolution. Why? Well, Cromwell and now built, they built a new army on Cromwell's pattern. And after this, uh, the war went on for several years until finally the Battle of Marsid Moor. And Meyer said more, Cromwell again with his 240 horse sitting on the one wing, swept the wing, smashed Leslie, the king's son, Prince Leslie, or uh, not Rupert, Prince Rupert, swept the wing as he did always before, came crashed on the other side of the wing as Leslie, his son-in-law of the Scotch, advanced, and they crushed the king's right and then swept the center of the line. Uh, after that battle, the king was taken, and the king was now pleaded with, that he would declare himself king, sovereign, ruler of England, and that all of the parliamentarians would give allegiance and swear allegiance and fidelity to the king. But he must renounce his divine right and his right in all religious matters, matters spiritual, that his power was limited to matters temporal. Well, Charlie knew better than that. Charlie knew that if he did that, 
He was nothing but a paper king. He was nothing but a puppet of parliament. And I'll say one thing about Charlie. He went to the grave, never flinching. <clears throat> no way he was going to be a king or he was going to be nothing. That king meant he had to be God. He understood what the structure was. Well, finally, the king gave his pr pledge that he would not raise any more army and so forth, and he gave his parole. And as soon as he was released, he immediately broke it, raised another army, and started in again. And so now, with the battle at, at Nasby Field, we have an exact repeat of Marsid Moore. The exact same maneuvers. Cramel Duff pulls it off again. And now the king is taken into custody. And now he was tried. He was brought to public trial under the laws of England, under the common law. A king tried by common law? A king subject to the law? A king answerable for his crimes? It had never happened in the history of the Western world. They brought a king to trial before his peers. And he was tried in open, legal, and proper court and was convicted as charged. And the penalty for those convictions by English law was death by the ax. And the king mounted the scaffold and his head rolled and his blood did not flow blue. This is the only time in the history of the Western world that a people had ever executed a king. Do you know what happened when that head rolled in the basket? The divine right of king died. The king was answerable. And when the monarchy was restored and they put Cromwell's head on that pike, and said, look what happens to a man who lays his lifts his hand against the king. I always think of Cromwell looking down at the House of Parliament and on the king as he opens up the house and saying, yes, oh, king. And remember what happens to a king who calls himself divine. Charlie's head rolled. No king of England since that date has ever dared declare himself the spiritual leader or issue a religious act. Cromwell had settled the issue. The second thing that was settled at Asby Field was this, that when a king broke the law, that the people had a right to resist. This was the principle. You see, the question was in the American Revolution, do we have the right to raise arms against our king? The answer to the scripture is no in matters political. But yes, if that king has broken the law. Now, see, the law of England was that the king of England or that the Engl England could not tax a colony for English purposes. All taxes in any colony, and always was in colonial law, could only be used within the colony. And that the people in that colony had a right of a voice in that taxation. When the intolerable acts were issued, in 1774 by the King of England against the Port of Boston. Under English law, it was the requirement of the people of Boston to raise up arms. That came from Nasby Field. You see, the question wasn't winning the American Revolution, it was starting it. Where was your authority for it? Well, that authority came from the King James Bible and from Charlie's head rolling. 1649 in that basket. The American Revolution was won by Oliver Cromwell. George Washington was an afterthought. Not taken away from it, but this is where the whole principle started. Now what happens? The American, by the way, Cromwell was seeking to try to do in England what we did here eventually 
a hundred and some years later uh, by a, a constitutional government. The only trouble is he never really figured it out. He had a problem, and that is he believed in the parliamentary form of government. Well, a parliamentary form of government says, and this is true in England today, if the parliament has the power, if it wanted to today, to pass a law that all people over five foot eight had to be killed, hung by a morning tomorrow, and that law would be lawful. There is no restriction on the parliament. She under British law. That's why the British citizen is not a citizen, he's a subject. He's a British subject. We're not subjects, we're citizens. Why? Because our government is restrained in what it can do. It's limited in its powers. This is the basic difference. We both use the same common law, right? But the difference is that government here is answerable to a constitution. It has a restraint upon itself. And that restraint is the law, which it must obey. The divine right king of theory went one further, you see, in the American Constitution. And the problem with Cromwell was he believed in the parliament. He was a parliamentarian. He believed in the king. He believed in the monarchy. And he believed in the parliament. But what he didn't understand, he kept thinking that he was going to get good men in the parliament. He kept dismissing the parliament and getting a new parliament. He brought all preachers in. And they did worse evil than the others had done. He tried seven different parliaments. He tried every way he could get to get a parliament together in order to have just laws and a proper ruling of England, a ruling a Christian government and a Christian nation, what he dreamed of. And the problem is it never worked. You know why it never worked? The system is wrong. He wanted to find good men who would run and create a good government. There are no such thing. All of sin comes short of the glory. There are no good men. We all have that nature. That physical nature. See, our founding fathers did not hope to get good men. What they realized was going to be a bunch of bad men in government, but we'll restrain on what they can do and limit their badness. <laughs> All right? You know, see, it was realistic. Cromwell never understood this. Cromwell was a preacher who believed that somehow he could find good men who would run England justly. Well, let's say he did. What's going to say when they die and pass away that the new ones are going to come are going to be good? What is the preservation of that system? Well, the fact is when Cromwell died, even in his final prayers, he prayed for the mercy of God upon these people. He had no hope that he was going to leave a regime. He had no hope that this thing could survive his death. He knew it was going to go under the next day, which it did. Those boys moved right back in, took right back over the monarchy and so forth and set the old machine up. He did not believe that he had created it. He tried to create a Christian government. He knew it couldn't survive him. Do you know why? The sin of the people of England in his dying prayer, that they looked to Cromwell, to a man. They put him up on a pedestal as a god, and they started worshiping Cromwell. And he pleaded, oh, can't they see I'm a mortal man? I die and have all the infirmities. You can't put your trust in a man. Everybody's looking for a guy we can elect. A man in a white horse is going to come and solve all of our problems, you see. Cromwell says, why would they not put their trust in thee? Why can they not put their trust in thy word? Why do they have to look to a man? Isn't that our nature? We want to find our leader, our hero, and go and follow him. That's why Cromwell had no hope. He knew that the English people, for the liberties that he was able to give them and for the prosperity he was able to bring, that they thought it came from him. They didn't understand. And so he knew that this moment he was gone, the whole thing was going to explode. It was all going to be gone. And what we have here is a small interlude of 20 years in England. Well, the English people had liberty and prosperity they'd never had before. But immediately on his death, you know what happened when the king came in? The first thing they declared was the expulsion acts. That no person who had been poured out of the government or part of the Civil War could hold office in England. And no person could preach who had ever been part. Which meant all the Puritan preachers couldn't preach. That's why we find people like uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, what's his name? Bunyan. That's why we find him in jail. He was one of them. <laughs> All the good preachers were in jail. <laughs> if you weren't in jail, there was something wrong with you. Of course, most of them fled to this country. They got on boats and headed out of there. 
and those who remained uh, got gunned down and shot to every place. But the king now declared deism. God does not directly affect the affairs of man. That was the religion. And the expulsion of the preachers. And you know what happened after they expelled them? England went into an age for 60 years known as the gin craze. The nation of England went on the biggest national drunk the world has ever known. Once out of every six buildings in England became the seller and distributor of alcoholic spirits, mainly gin. The nation went absolutely bombed out. As one lord stood up in the house of Lord, he says, what is, why should we be concerned what happens to these people? They're all dying from gin anyway. The nation was, uh, the churches were all closed, the gospel wasn't preached, England became as atheistic as any nation in the world and became totally poverty stricken. The nation went into the dregs. England became nothing but a cesspool. By the way, England never ruled the waves until Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell defeated with never having more than 30,000 men at arms. Scotland, Ireland, France, Germany, Spain, and Holland, plus the King of England. All the kings tried to, tried to get at him, and finally they decided to leave this guy alone. Let's wait for him to die. He was invincible. They called him Ironsides. Just to show you, give you one of his many battles, and this was with the Scots. And he had a problem with the Scots because Leslie was his commander at Nasby Field and at Marsted Moor and knew all of his tactics. And Leslie, a Scotchman, was leading the Scotch army. And Cromwell had tried for two years to corner Leslie. And Leslie had outmaneuvered him continuously. And finally, he had maneuvered Cromwell into a peninsula. His army was now sick, been out in bad weather for two years, was uh, incapable uh, on this peninsula of getting off. It was too rugged. The ships could not get in. And Cromwell knew that the next day that he would be defeated as he sent a communication to the parliament to raise every, every man at arms in England to defend the border because the next day there was no hope. His army would be destroyed. That night he prays, oh God, give him into my hands. If it be thy will, deliver him. You must deliver him in the morning. Two years. In the morning, Leslie makes his first tactical error. He divides his army and sends them half down on the flats with half them on the hills. And Cromwell in the dawn looks and he says, Oh, Lord, thou hast delivered him. He masses his army onto the flank, destroys that army in the flats and charges up. And by noon, he had killed 5,000, captured 10,000, took all their arms and all of their baggage and conquered all of Scotland, lost. 214 men. How? He always asks quite how. He never attributed a victory to his own, to himself. Never in any of his writings. Here's a book, Crown Cromwell. Tremendous book if you want to really inspire everybody. He never, he knew that everything was the direct intervention of God's hand. Think of this versus the king who says, God is sleeps. <laughs> you see? The two different views. But notice, what was the political power that revol uh, changed England and changed it back? Religion. At the turn of that century, 1699, was a man born in the back room of a bar, George Whitfield. George Whitfield was a poor boy. One time go to school, he had no money to go to school, the family too poor to send him. But in those days, you could go to school if you lived in, if the wealthy kids had uh, four of them in the, or three of them would live in a little nice home of some sort at places like Oxford and Cambridge. And if you were poor, you could go and serve these men as their complete lackey and as their slave in return. They had to support you through school. You were able to eat in the back room, and you were able to go to school, and they had to support you. And that's how uh, Whitfield 
went through Oxford. And there, he fell in with a couple of his people, John Wesley and a group of people who were called Methodists. But he realized their doctrine was wrong, even though they made him the leader of the group, which was unthinkable, considering he was a lackey and a slave, <laughs> really, and these others were all uh, noblemen. But George Whitfield, after he uh, graduated, Wesley went down, who was supposed to be the big, big gun, and he goes down to Georgia, he was going to be an evangelist. He came back two years later with the sheriff after him. Uh, <clears throat> didn't have one conversion, but I guess it was a problem with somebody's daughter that ended up with this sheriff chasing him. But anyway, he had a run for it. And the day he came back was the day Whitfield was leaving for Georgia. Whitfield preached all the colonies. He made seven trips over here. And he preached to every founding father, every signer of the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution of the United States heard George Whitfield. George Whitfield has to be, in my mind, the greatest preacher since Apostle Paul and either before or after Whitfield. Whitfield was the first, second man, really, to go out into the field and preach. It wasn't John Wesley. Wesley took uh, Whitfield, gave him the, the churches there in the south of England. But Whitfield went out, and he started where no churches, and nobody went to England. He went down to the head animals in the south of England over there in the coal district. They weren't allowed to go in any towns or anything. They lived below ground, totally black, never washed, no schools, nothing. They were just fed like animals and sent back down in the mines. And these people came out of the mines, and Whitfield happened to have a little time off. He's standing there one day, and he gets up as these people coming out, uh, these, just like animals coming out of these holes. And he started preaching. And he stood there and preaching, and he said the first time there was any indication there was a white man in the whole group was the white streaks that started down the cheeks. He was preaching to 100,000 at a time in the open air. He went to London and he starts preaching around London and he was preaching to upwards of 350,000 a day with no mic, uh, loudspeaker. Now that's a preacher. In a country that couldn't turn out 300,000 in a year in all the churches in the whole country, he would pull them out every day. And he would start preaching at four in the afternoon, and he would preach by moving from one place to another around London to the fields. And then he would go and set up in a house, and he would sit and teach until two or three in the morning, sleep a few hours, and at dawn he'd be there as they would come in with their problems, counseling all day, start out again in the early afternoon, back out to the rounds of preaching. He converted England. And he never built a church, never had an organization, never sent by a missionary board. <laughs> See, he was one that was sent. He didn't get up, go, and went. Right? This guy came to this country, which was mainly member, populated by prisoners and, and the dropouts, the dregs of the English society, the worst of it. And this country was far country from being Christian, the colonies. They were probably about the most unchristian as you could get, except for a very few small little enclaves. By the time Crom or, 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 um, Whitfield had preached all the way in every colony, making seven trips up and down those colonies, he had converted the colonies. When it came time to write that Declaration of Independence and that Constitution of the United States, it was the preaching of George Whitfield that was the major instrument in coming out with the doctrine documents that we have. Without George Whitfield, you know, uh, one of his friends was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin said, George Whitfield never got the one thing he craved most, my soul. But Benjamin Franklin, of course, he couldn't believe all the things he said about Whitfield. And here he is in Boston. You can imagine Franklin out there with strings measuring the crowd as he laid out the pattern because he couldn't believe that 100,000 could hear a man with not a strong voice. And he said, standing back at his distances that he had calculated, they can. He has that voice. And here at the feet of George Whitfield on the Boston Commons, Jonathan Edwards at his at Cromwell, or I mean, at uh, Whitfield's feet, screaming, no man has ever preached like this man preached. That's quite something coming from Jonathan Edwards. 
probably the greatest preacher this country <laughs> had raised. You see, just like Apostle Paul, what overturned the Roman Empire? What did this Caesar say? These men are turning the world upside down. Paul and Silas with no money, nothing, walking out there across the Roman Empire against the greatest military power, the political power, all of the pornography of the pagan religions, all of the filth of it, all of the idolatry, all of the imagery, everything, every bit of corruption this world knows today. The Roman Empire knew it worse. And yet these two guys, three, four guys, five small handful walking around, were turning the whole system upside down. Why? They're saying, Caesar puts his pants on one leg at a time. That doctrine overthrew. What, where was Cromwell's power? It wasn't his, it was that Bible. These people knew that word. And when they knew that word, Charlie was done, whether it was in Oliver Cromwell or who, made no difference. The system was at the end. What created this Constitution? And the Declaration of Independence and gave this people here in this world, in this country, in this small place, in the history of the world, something that nobody else has ever known before or since. Do you realize there's not another nation in the world that has a constitution as ours to limit their government? Better to give powers to the government. Ours is something quite unique. There is no other constitution ever been. Even as, as Gladstone said, the Prime Minister of England, it is the greatest document ever struck by the hands of man, the American Constitution. That's something from a British Prime Minister. There's nothing in England like it. Why? It was because of a religious conviction and position that the American people had in sufficient number at the time of the, sound, the signing of that Constitution. It meant that no other document could have been given. Not that these men were so noble and such great Christians who wrote it, but they knew what they had to put in there and get these people to accept it. They were not going to buy a parliamentary form of government. They couldn't, they would have sold it to them if they could have, but they couldn't have. You see, the greatest of all of the revolutionary heroes of this country, by far, is a man named Jonathan, or, or, or George Whitfield. And you know, you can go up there in Kenny Punkport, Maine, where George Whitfield died, and you can see his body. It's now you go in this little church down behind the furnace, there's a little room, you open the room, there's the first preacher in there for about the, you know, 1650s and Jonathan Edwards with the glass on the coffin there. You can go in and see it. No great big monument or any great big mausoleum sticking somewhere. Uh, I mean, what, George Whitfield, that's how you go see George Whitfield. Go in that little old church back there and there's George. Nobody ever thought of building him uh, a great temple somewhere on the Potomac. When George Whitfield stood there and preached his last sermon with blood coming out of his mouth, and he went next door to rest. And these people knew he was dying. The people got out in front of uh, that house and they cried and cried and cried until he came out. And he opened the book, preached his last sermon, walked in and died. Faithful to the last breath. He'd run the race. He had fought the good fight. What I'm trying to tell you is this, if you haven't got the message, the real warfare has always been spiritual. What they want to do is poo-poo religion today. Well, that's a little something you have over here on Sunday morning and some little something or other, and you know, a couple little stories and Bible stories on flannel graphs. There's no Sunday school set up in that Bible. In our church, we have all the squalling babies, and they sit there under the preaching of that gospel. They all are there. And you wonder, what is a two-year-old, three-year-old? Well, I didn't know until I find out what my little nine-year-old knows. He's been under that gospel all of his life since he was born. You don't know when they start understanding. They understand a lot more than you think they understand. You put them on there in that nice little Sunday school down there with their flannel graphs, playing their little games, and they sit there and they grow up as I did in those Sunday schools, and you realize you, there was nothing to this thing. And what do you think? Those people are going to go to church. I had no interest in it at all. Why? 
It was nothing but a big Sunday school. Right? The Spain guy. Anyway, how are we going? They got some goodies over here they want to sell. Why don't we go over and get some goodies? And uh, then we'll just uh, look at a set of slides and then we'll break for lunch. Uh, what, what are your, how are you going to have lunch? Everybody on their own, run for it? Well, they're going to have lunch here. Wow, that's pretty good. Why don't we go over here and get ourselves some coffee and donuts and stretch a little bit and try to get those wooden chairs unplied from you? 